Okay, welcome. My name's Dr. David Ricketts. I work for Health Service Laboratories as head of the process improvement, but my other job is I'm the UK principal expert on ISO standards. And what I'm going to be doing today is taking you through the talk that I first gave at Congress, which is the progress on where we are with the new version of ISO 15189. But since Congress, we've actually had some meetings with our international colleagues, so I can actually provide some more information for you as we are pretty much near the final document and we're almost ready to go for our final vote. So what I want to do is just take you through the journey on how we've got there and some things to expect with this new document. Okay, so the learning outcomes we have from this talk today. I want to talk to you about how we understand how we're developing the document, to start to think about how we're going to apply this document and also so you're aware of the next steps because this is actually going to be quite a major change from the version that we all know and love, I guess. So we'll be talking really about what to expect and really give you some pre-warning what you need to start working on. So ISO 15189 has gone through something called a disc ballot and I'll explain what a disc ballot is in a minute. Um, only one country voted no and their comments are being reviewed by the drafting committee. Um, in fact, that country um, we still haven't had any feedback from as we've had our international meeting and unfortunately they weren't there, but we will keep reaching out to them. Uh, point of care testing now is actually integrated into the main standard and that was always the intent for point of care testing. So I know some people are saying, well, why don't we just keep this separate? The standard was always meant to be part of the, the main laboratory standard, not a substandard. So that's been corrected now. This document has been agreed by international consensus, which is really important, and as such must be written to be usable across many different jurisdictions. And some of the interesting comments we've got now is there's bits in the standard that we know, for example, in America, the law has changed. And as we remind people that law and regulation always trump standard. So if a standard is asking you to do something, but your international regulations say you can't, you follow the regulation. Also, if the standard is exceeding what we ask for the regulation, as long as you're not breaking the law, you can exceed the regulation. In fact, we encourage the standard to be a minimum. There's 177 pages of comments, which we have now worked through. And this slide for the conference says that we were working through them during the conference. Well, in fact, now we've worked through those and we've fed all of those comments back to our international partners and spent two days discussing with them why we've chosen stuff, what's happening, and we've made adjustments based on international consensus from this meeting. And the working group, as I say, has happened, um, and we're hoping that the next step will be FDIS, not a DIS. And I'll explain what an FDIS is and why it's important. As I say, it's a very useful two days of uh, communication. We had 80 uh, delegates from around the world all discussing the comments and also asking some various clarifications and that will impact the final document. So why are we writing a new standard? Well the parent standard is ISO 17025 um, and we have to stick to the same format of that. And that got the changed in structure and mirrored the changes when ISO 9001, which is the parent standard, changed. Um, and as this is a normative reference, which means you need to read and understand 17025 to be able to apply 15189, which, don't worry, most people don't. We've written the standard so you can actually comply to what you need in 17025 by just complying to 15189. Um, we had to revise it and comply to the new structure. As well as that, 15189 has hit a review period, and the review period is normally five to seven years after a standard is launched, so make sure it's still relevant. For those keen observers, you may notice that we're longer than five years and seven years. It's actually 10 years since the last standard. But a vote was taken to revise the document, and these documents are not written over, overnight. They do take several years and lots of different versions to actually come to the light of day. So we have documents we have to abide by. And there's two ISO documents, which are Directives Part 1 and 2, which are freely available. Uh, these are updated frequently and therefore it's important we're aware of any changes in writing the standard. And for those of you that wish for a cure for insomnia, you can actually read these standards. They are quite heavy going, but as standard writers we need to know and understand them. 
because these tell us how we write a standard and the process that we have to go to for the standard to be used. One of the big changes is we had to align with the change in notes. If you look at the 2012 version, you'll see lots of shells and shooting notes. We no longer can do that. And in fact, that changed as we were writing the standard. So if anything that we used to put in a note that was something that had a shell or a should, it had to go in the main text. And we've also written copious notes in this standard, but these, standard, these notes we've actually thinned out as we've gone along because instructions from the ISO committee is that, you know, we have to not have too many notes in there. But notes are very useful because they actually allow us to give you hints and ideas on what we mean by the standard. The other document is something called PROC 33, which is a CASCO document. And these are the conformity assessment people. Um, and this is how conformance standards, which 15189 is, has to be written. Um, and again, as would happen, these changed mid-drafting. So section eight had to be revised in line with the new standards. And it removes options in the quality management standard, because we used to have different options, now we have one option. As well as that, CASCO Prop 33 has something called mandatory text, and that mandatory text we cannot change. So when we wrote the standard and sent it out, we put the text in grey so people knew that this was mandatory text that we had to follow. Didn't stop people commenting, of course, but um, you won't see that in the final version because that text will actually look like any other text. But just so you're aware, we do have mandatory parts of the standard that we have to comply to. So let's look at the jargon, a jargon, a DIS, which is a draft international standard. Um, it's a document produced after the committee has finished writing the document. So we've done several versions of committee draft before we get to something that goes to the wider international community. And this is possible to have several drafts and votes. Because we've did lots of committee drafts and lots of communication with our international partners as we're writing this, we could actually get away with only one this stage. Um, and that's because we maybe had five or six iterations before we actually went to this. Lots of international involvement, lots of comments. Um, we had thousands and thousands of comments. And we've distilled those into the final product that went to this. And even this, this, despite the fact that this standard had been reviewed many times, we still had 177 pages of comments. But we've now worked through all of those and we're now hopefully in the F this stage, which is the final text. So this is the one that goes for a vote and approval, and any technical comments now in the F this get held over to the next version, and we'll start the review process of the next version in five years' time, and expect to take another four or five years to write it, so you don't need to worry. Um, we can have two F this valids. We are hoping, because we've only had one negative vote, and the rules are that you need to have 75% positive votes and no more than 25% negative because there's abstentions as well, the mess does work out. But as I say, at the moment on the this ballot, we were 98% approval. So we're very hopeful that the FDIS, now we've gone through the comments again, will become the standard. And we hope it's published either towards the end of this year or beginning of next year. And that depends really on how long the ISO committee takes to get the translations done, check the formatting, check the language and make sure it complies to ISO regulations. And that can take several months. But hopefully in a meeting in May, we will be in a position to recommend the FDIS ballot and that ballot will be, I think, an eight week ballot, which will go out hopefully in June. Some people keep asking me why we only have one medical laboratory standard because we've many sister documents, such as risk, such as safety, uh, but when we're writing the standard, it has to be focused and manageable. If we write a 400-page document, it becomes cumbersome and unreadable. Um, and the work revised to take uh, even one of these documents takes years. And imagine trying to do that in a 400-page document. The time frame would just be impossible. As well as that, we need experts with specific knowledge. So we'll bring safety and risk experts in for those standards who may not be interested in the main laboratory standard. And it's really important that we have good use of working time because this is hundreds and hundreds of hours of time for the people involved in standard writing. You know, it's not just the we write one document and that's it. We have iterations of documents, we have to negotiate the meaning and we have to have this conversation globally to make sure that it's fit for purpose across the world. 
So we need to have smaller and more focused documents and they're easier to track and revise. And just try and imagine accrediting to a document covering everything. It's, it's tough enough going through 15189. So some key concepts that you need to be aware of. This version is patient focused and we make no apologies for this. Um, it's still in development but we actually have most of the standard done now and I can actually report we're pretty much there because we've had our final consultation with the community. And don't forget the standard is a minimum requirement, not maximum. Just because the standard doesn't say you need to do something doesn't mean you can't do it. It actually sets you a minimum. We encourage people to exceed the standard um, and we want people to be the best they can, not just reach a minimum set out by a standard and be happy with that. And it doesn't prevent you from doing things that are optional or no longer required. For example, a quality manual is no longer required, but it doesn't mean you can't have one. We still need that information. You may actually say a quality manual is the best way of doing that. And that's something that's been passed down from 9001 through 17025. So that's why it's no longer a requirement, because it isn't a requirement in 9001. It's about understanding your laboratory and the risk to patients. There's an, a lot of reference to risk and understanding risk. And this has to be defined by the laboratory and justified in how this is identified and steps taken to mitigate the risk. When we're looking at audit, the first thing that we're asking you to audit is the risk to patient care and improving patient care. There is also support documents, which are not compulsory, but designed to support the laboratory for risk. So if you look at ISO 22367, a 2020 document, the application of risk management to medical laboratories, and ISO 35001, which is a 2019 document, which is a more general bio-risk management for laboratories and other related organisations. Both have a wealth of information if you're looking to support how you deal with risk. And in fact, one of the key things on 22367 is the fact that one of the risk factors you actually have to take into account now is the medical requirement for something and the clinical requirement. And it absolutely is a risk factor that you should be considering. So the standard has not been written as too prescriptive. That has been tightened up somewhat with the feedback from the community. Phrases have been deliberately chosen. We still have phrases such as as appropriate, when required, to the extent necessary, where relevant, and according to patient harm, all in the standard. Um, we have an option to omit some information, but thus must be articulated. And again, we've had a lot of debate about how prescriptive we're going to be on this. Um, so the, the standard will need careful readings and understanding to help the implementation. And um, one of the jobs I'll have when this standard is um, ready to go out is I will be writing an expert commentary to support the launch. And the expert commentary will describe how this standard has changed from 2012 and what you need to be ready for. Just be aware it's only a 2,000 word document, so I can't go into great detail in that, but we have plans to sort this. So if we look at linked documents, we have at the moment uh, an ISO TS, which is Technical Specification 20658. This has now been written to a full standard and we're working very closely with the team writing that to make sure that 15189 and this dovetail with no contradiction. And there's greater detail in 20658 for pre-laboratory activities, but there's still sufficient detail in 15189 to tell you what you need to do for pre-laboratory activity. We also have ISO TS 20914, which is the practical guidance of estimation of measurement uncertainty. We mention, of course, measurement uncertainty, and this is always a great debate with people as why do it. So we've been very practical in our description in 15189, the new version. So for example, there's no requirement to report MU in the new standard, but it must be available on request. And also we're giving advice on how to deal with MU that's not applicable or possible, because it not necessarily is. But the 20914 document has some very good examples that you can use to help you express measurement uncertainty. So other documents you need to be aware of. So this was an FDIS, this is now a live document, which is 15190, which is requirements for safety. 
And again, it's a really useful document to read and understand as it covers concepts in the new standard, for example, emergency shells, and the fact that that needs to be a risk-based requirement, not an absolute requirement. And there's also a significant volume of standards supporting molecular pre-analytical phase, which are covered in the 1.7 series of standards, and there's about 30 of those, written by a very enthusiastic uh, group of people involved. And this is really just trying to improve the quality of a lot of our DNA, RNA methods by looking at the sample transportation. Because the methods themselves are really good, but we found the variable results were due to the fact that everyone was just sending them to the lab in a different way. So now we've got a very standardised suite of standards to support that, and I recommend that you look at those. These will all be, by the way, in the bibliography. OK, the verbiage is the same as shall, should, may and can. Shall's a requirement. That's your critical non-conformance in ISO terms, or in UCAS terms. Should indicating a recommendation. May indicating permission. Can indicating possibility of capability. The, ex the expectation is that any should statements not followed have a justification attached. A should statement should not be ignored. So if it says should and you don't follow it, well, why? But you're not going to get a critical non-conformance, but we are really encouraging on inspections that we understand why you're not following a should statement. And there could be good reason, but we need to understand the thought process. It's not an ignore me. Again, no longer requirement for a quality, quality manager, a manual. Sorry, This does not mean that you can't have one. It's just no longer compulsory, um, and the information needs to be recorded somewhere. Um, this also means you can have quality managers. They're, in fact, needed, although we don't actually use the term. Um, but we do give things that however you wish to do this. But quality managers are needed. Um, and it has to be appropriate to the service, so there's a greater flexibility in how this is delivered. Service agreements are really important, especially point of care now is managed by service agreements. So we expect a service agreement between, say, A&E blood gases in the lab, or A&E all point of care with the lab, and that will define how you then bring point of care into the fold of the 15189. There is no longer a requirement for a multidisciplinary team to oversee point of care. And this is managed by service agreements. And if you do have a team, they may be the ones you wish to manage the service agreements from. It doesn't mean you can't have a multidisciplinary team. We're just saying it's no longer compulsory. Because that was one of the major sticking points for people actually applying for the old point of care standard. It's getting enough people of interest to turn up for what may be a long meeting and only five minutes of their valuable time is needed in that meeting. So we've looked at that as a way around that. We no longer use the term request form. This is in recognition there's many ways to request testing. There's still information required on requesting testing. And, and the statement, and this statement is still the same, is that it can be any form or medium agreed between the requester and the laboratory. And this will cover the concept of add-ons as well. So we need that information, but we're very aware that this no longer tends to be bits of paper passing around that we traditionally think of a request form as. So we're not we're saying examination request, and we need to know what the request is. We give you criteria, but how you do that will be very much agreed between yourselves and your use, users. Labelling samples is risk-based. There is no longer a recommendation on what needs to be written and printed on the tube. Remember their regulatory requirements for transfusion, and a GP urine and a histology sample have different risks in accepting. Um, in terms of process or not to process, the recommendation is to look at the risk to the patient by processing or not processing, and use this as a guide for decision making. One of the things that we used to have is we say you need four identifiers, which technically meant any GP urine collected by a patient that they've just written their first and surname on, you should be rejecting. Well, that's actually a very low risk thing, so you can then write a risk statement around that. From a GP, you'll accept this, but understand that there is a risk involved, but it's very low risk. Whereas something like blood transfusion, where you absolutely have regulation, then you expect a much higher candor and a much better level of detail in what accepting that is normally set out by regulation. Notes, as previously stated, um, that we have to follow by the new rules of the ISO directives. There's still an extensive use of notes, not as many as we had, because some of those have been reworked. Um, but they've been deliberately chosen for their wording. 
Um, the notes are there for a reason and I encourage you to read them because they actually shine some light on what the intention we have and give you some information to just point you in how to cope with the standard and deliver on the standard. There's a lot of dialogue regarding third party QC um, and the recommendation is this should be considered. And we're looking at QC about relevance to clinical decision limits when looking at levels. Um, this is still under discussion. Um, we've had some feedback on this and we'll see how the, the final version goes. But the intention is that it has to be relevant to clinical decision levels. But we also have to be very pragmatic about where we are with QC and what's actually available. So we're looking at a compromise there of making it relevant, but also not impossible to achieve because the product just isn't there. So we're looking at the wording there. And also the frequency we're saying is based on sample stability and risk of harm to the patient of a QC fail. That's not really changed because it's really important that you understand the purpose of QC and the impact on patient care. And this actually has been one of the most scrutinised and rewritten parts of the standard. So, full planning's in there. We look at uh, contingency planning and robust disaster recovery plans. And this has been influenced by things like the earthquake in New Zealand where we lost laboratories and of course the COVID pandemic stretching pathology service. There's been considerable feedback on this um, and very much we've agreed this needs to stay in the standard. There's been some tinkering with the words to make it more readable and more usable but you really do need to look at your full planning and your contingency planning as part of this standard. Because you know we've all learned the hard way how services can change very quickly and we've had to adapt very quickly, which we've been excellent at. This is not a blood science standard. One of the criticisms we had is it was written for blood sciences. Um, so we're taking great care to ensure relevance to all disciplines in pathology. And things like molecular pathology have really grown since 2012. Um, we're also aware that this is intended for histopathology, but some countries don't use it. So, for example, there's a, a guide using the standard being prepared for histopathologists. And we certainly engage with many genetics networks in the development of this standard to make sure it's fit, fit for purpose for services such as that. And we've tried to be very inclusive in our experts, especially in the UK, to, go, to gather all disciplines to make sure that we've got the wording that's fit for purpose for all. So there's been an extensive uh, communication with all professional bodies in UCAS as the drafts have developed. We have an expert panel which we had to input to advise on the UK position, drawn <coughs> excuse me, from industry and across uh, the disciplines in pathology. And there's also uh, a plan for a meeting to produce guidance uh, for compliance to assist the standard and we're looking to work with the college, the ACB, the IBMS and UCAS to develop a format. So we have some recommendations because we know now what this standard's going to look like. So I'm now beginning to work with all the professional bodies in UCAS to try and get some guidance out there. So when this standard hits, you actually have a good idea on what to do. So communication will be key. And we have um, a webinar planned for later in the year, I think in November, um, where I'll be running a webinar to go through the final version of the standard and just talk people through it. And um, the exact details of that webinar we're still finalising, but once we've gone to an F this vote and we know it's there, we can be very sure on what we're talking about. This will not be a tick box standard. We'll need you to understand the service and customer needs Consider your risk and how you can describe and mitigate them. And again, there will be documentation to help you navigate this standard. We're not just going to throw this standard out there and leave you floundering. We're going to work really hard to try and explain what's expected for you. So that's an update of the project. I hope you found it useful. Um, and as I say, there will be, as this document goes through final stages, there will be a lot of communication across the UK to help everyone adapt to the standard. And thank you for your time listening to this talk.